Well, hi again. Here we are. Labs from the barn. This should be the very last one, though, I promise. Now, today what we're going to look at is a method of analysis that's been around a long time. It's called chromatography. And it's just a, a, a technique for the separation of mixtures, uh, usually based on solubilities or polarities of molecules. Uh, we can separate polar from nonpolar using chromatography or even just molecular size. And so before I start the, the demonstration that I've got lined up for you for this last lab, uh, let's go to the blackboard and let me just show you a couple interesting things about chromatography. Here you go. Okay, well I mentioned that chromatography is really just a technique for the separation of mixtures. This is a technique has been around for a long time and it's basically made up of three components. So just to be a little more specific, let me erase this and I'll show you. Okay, well here's the basis for a chromatographic type separation. Now, these separations can be based on things like molecular size, I mean, for instance, if I just took a window screen and put sand on it, well, the smaller pieces of sand would go through the window screen, but the larger pieces would be retained. All right, well, that's a separation based on their physical size. Well, that's kind of what chromatography is like. You can do separations based on size, on the polarity of molecules, which is kind of an interesting way to look at things, considering we've just looked at that with the Lewis structures and the polarity of molecules. And you can do it with solubilities also. For instance, if you took sodium chloride, just regular old table salt, say we ground it up in a mortar and a pestle with some chalk, just regular old plain chalk. All right, well, chalk's not soluble in water. Uh, however, the sodium chloride is. So if we ground it up in a mortar and pestle, you'd be hard pressed to get in there with tweezers and separate the sodium chloride crystals from the calcium carbonate crystals that make up the chalk. But if we were to take just a little sample of that and say we put it on a glass piece of glass, like a slide, like a microscope slide, and let's dribble some water on it and let the water run down the slide and then run off the edge of the slide. Well, I think you'd agree that the interaction of the sodium chloride with the water is going to be greater because it's more soluble in the water. And after a time, we would end up probably with two piles if we stopped pouring water on it we'd affect a separation where the sodium chloride would definitely get out ahead of the calcium carbonate that's in the chalk. And again, so we base the separation on, on their differing solubilities in the water that we're dribbling on there. Well, this illustrates the three components that's necessary for a chromatographic separation. One is called the stationary phase. That's the thing that sits still. In this case, that's the piece of glass that we've got the sample sitting on. That's the thing that would retain everybody. Second, we've got a mobile phase. That's something that washes over the stationary phase. In this case, it's the water that's washing over the, the mixture and the, and the stationary phase. And third would be the mixture itself. All right, well, you can see that our, my simple little example here pretty much illustrates all three components then in a chromatographic separation. But we've sophisticated our methods over the years, so let me just show you a couple of techniques that we use. Now, one of the methods back when I was working at Daily Laboratories, we used to get in collections of solvents from companies, or actually mixtures of solvents, that they were going to dispose of and it would end up being buried in a hazardous waste landfill. And before you can assess, well, how much are they going to be charged for burying this in this hazardous waste landfill, they needed an assay of, well, what percentage of it was toluene, what percentage was benzene, you know, all these different solvents that they used. So they'd send us a small sample, and they'd ask us to give them a percent composition, an assay of, of their solvents. And so, consequently, since it was such a big smorgasbord of compounds, we would do a really quick and dirty sort of segregation of the smaller molecules from the medium-sized ones from the larger ones. 
and we did it with a chromatographic separation. We had a burette uh, that was really big, about a foot in diameter across the top, like the burettes that we use for our acid-base titrations. And we filled it with something called, uh, oh, I can't even recall, fluorocyl, I think was the name of the gel that we used. But it was very fibrous. We would put it in here with a solvent, with hexane. And it would soak up the hexane. It would look like you put a bunch of cotton balls in water. They would just swell up. And it was just all this fibrous stuff that was in here. Well, then we would pour some of the mixture of solvent in there. This uh, mixture of hexane, and, or not hexane, but uh, toluene and xylene and benzene and a whole bunch of other different industrial solvents. So we would pour it in there and it would begin to percolate its way through to the bottom. And we would wash it through with a little bit of nice pure hexane, something that we knew wasn't in their mixture. Well, then we would start collecting fractions down here at the bottom in a, in a collection flask. And essentially the first section that would come through, the smaller molecules could worm their way through that, that gel much quicker. And so it was a real quick way to let the little molecules get through there fast. And we would get a nice collection of the small ones first, and then followed by the medium-sized ones. And then the very last fraction that we would collect would be the very large molecules. Okay, so you can see that there was a stationary phase, which was the gel that sat still. And then the, the mobile phase was the extra hexane that we put in there to wash everything through. And naturally, we had a mixture. All right, so this was called gel permeation chromatography. And again, it's just a nice quick and dirty way to do a quick segregation of small molecules from medium ones to large ones. All right, well, let me show you another method. Okay, now this form of chromatography, gas chromatography, probably the most popular. You cannot walk into a lab uh, in, anywhere and not find half a dozen or a dozen Hewlett Packard gas chromatographs sitting around on bench tops. Uh, they're about the size of a Coleman cooler. They're a wonderful way to separate mixtures of compounds. Usually they're used in conjunction with another analysis tool called a mass spectrometer that actually identifies the components of the mixtures. But the separation itself is a pretty amazing task done by this machine. Now they use, as their stationary phase, a glass capillary column that's 100 meters long, a football field in length, but it's coiled up really nice and tight. It's a very small capillary made out of glass. And so it doesn't take up much room, you know, just about the size of a very small inner tube for like a, a small wheel about that big. All right, well, that's small enough that you can put it in a very small oven. So again, a gas chromatograph is not very big. Now the inside of that capillary tube is only 250 micrometers across. And when we inject a sample into this, we don't need to use very much. And so at the top of the injection port, and they use a syringe to inject a very small sample, usually around 10 microliters. You can't even see that that when you shoot it out in the air, that's not even a whole drop. They'll shoot it at the top of the injection port where it's heated and turned into a vapor. Then they push it through with argon gas. Now, hence, that's our mobile phase, is the argon that's washing over the, uh, the uh, stationary phase, which is the column. They put the entire column inside an oven that they can control the temperature of, so you can program it so that you can ramp the temperature up as the analysis uh, proceeds. And uh, the inside of the column is actually coated with a support compound inside here that's generally very polar. So consequently, that compound attracts other polar molecules. Polar molecules attract each other because they have a positive end and a negative end, sort of like a little magnet. So that means that anything that's polar that's traveling through that 100 meter long column is going to get slowed down a little bit by the attraction it has for the walls. The more polar it is, the slower it's going to go. So you can see what's going to happen. After it passes through 100 meters of that column, when it comes out the end, the least polar compounds are going to come sailing off first, followed by the next least. Finally, you'll get to the most polar compounds at the very last. 
So we put the detector down here at the bottom of the column, generally, like I said, a mass spectrometer, and it identifies each and every component that comes off the end of the gas chromatograph. So this has become an extremely powerful, powerful analysis tool for the chemist over the years. And they've really uh, tweaked the technology where, again, you can ramp the temperatures of the ovens so that you can, you can really nail down a lot of different components, uh, particularly pollutants that we find in the environment. Uh, when I was working at the labs, a gas chromatograph was my thing, and, and we were always looking for pesticides and drinking water. And these machines are extremely sensitive. You can detect down in the part per billion range of pesticides and drinking water. Well, let me show you one other, one other form of chromatographic analysis. As a matter of fact, the one that we're going to use today in, in, uh, in our little demonstration. Okay, this form of chromatography, paper chromatography, this is what my little demonstration is going to be uh, using today and what we had intended for you to do in the lab is we were going to have you take a piece of filter paper that we had cut out for you. Hold on just a second. Get something out of the way. We were going to have you put a starting line on it and then put a sample of glycine, leucine, uh, tyrosine, and aspartic acid four different amino acids on there, just a little spot. We we're gonna set it down in a mixture of isopropyl alcohol and, uh, and ammonia, and curl it all up into a cylinder and staple it and put it in a beaker of this solvent so it would begin to wick its way up the paper. Well, after it had wicked its way up to the top of the paper, it usually took about an hour for that to happen, so we just usually had a little coffee break while we waited for this to happen. We find that the glycine, the leucine, and, and the tyrosine and aspartic acid all had differing solubilities in the solvent. And so each was carried a different distance up the paper based on their solubilities. So for instance, the glycine may not move very far, the leucine maybe a little more, tyrosine all the way up at the front, and maybe the aspartic acid somewhere in between. Well, then we would have you put an unknown on there that was a mixture of maybe two or three or maybe all four of them. And sure enough, as it rose, it would separate out into bands that would represent then the amino acids that were in that unknown. In this case, you can kind of tell it was the glycine and the aspartic acid just based on how far it traveled. All right, well, we're going to have you actually measure with a ruler. And I think I'm going to have you do that on the pre-lab also to submit to me. But we would have you measure with a ruler the distance the dot moved. We call that D. And then we would look at the distance the solvent moved. We call that L, that distance L. All right, well, and we, as soon as we pulled the chromatograph out of the solvent, we would have you put a pencil mark where the wet spot was because it would almost immediately evaporate. And so we needed that to measure to. All right, well, we would take the distance D the distance the dot moved divided by the distance the solvent moved, and we call that the retention factor. All right, I'm going to have you calculate the retention factor for all of the dots that are on the chromatograph that's on the pre-lab. But our intention had been for you to take an actual mixture of amino acids and, again, just tell us what was in your unknown. Now, the dramatic part of this was that amino acids are usually colorless, and so when you first separate it, you don't see anything. We have a staining agent called ninhydrin. We spray it on and suddenly the amino acids just pop out of there and they're really purple. And they each turn a kind of a unique shade of purple. So not only could you identify what was in your unknown just based on its retention factor, but, <coughs> excuse me, you could also do it by its color. And even the shape of the, the way it spread out in the solvent was unique to that amino acid. So it allowed us to make a, a really good definite analysis. When I was working at the lab, we used to do paper chromatography where we would take a drop of blood. I forget, I think they were doing drug analysis back then. And you could drop this in a, in a beaker of solvent and it would separate the blood out into, you know, four basic groups of compounds that had similar solubilities in that solvent. Then they would turn the card 90 degrees. So here's the original drop of blood and here's the four bands. Then they would drop it into a solvent with different, different polarity, and it would separate those bands out into different components. 
So all the different proteins and, and soluble organics that were in the blood would end up in different areas on the card based on their retention factor in the first solvent and then the retention factor in the second solvent. All right, so it was a very inexpensive, quick way to do a screening for certain proteins in blood. All right, so again, we don't have anything nearly as exciting for you as blood, and I don't even have the amino acids here, but I do have a little demonstration for you. So let's go there. Okay, so just for a nice quick demonstration of how paper chromatography works, I chose three different felt tip pens. I got a black one and a red one and a blue one. And I essentially took some filter paper from the lab and just cut little strips of paper and I put a line, black one on this one, then a red one, then a blue one. Now what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna kind of fold these in a little bit of a V so that they'll stand up nicely when I put them in the beaker. But I poured a little isopropyl alcohol in this beaker. And I'm gonna let, as a matter of fact, I want a little fresh alcohol. My first attempt didn't work so well and some ink got in the alcohol. All right, so some nice, fresh, clear alcohol. And I'm gonna stand the filter papers in there and let the alcohol wick its way up the paper. That was the black one, here's the red one. We're gonna let it go for probably a half hour or so, just cause it takes a while for the alcohol to wick its way up. But each of these inks, each of these different colors has a different formulation of dyes. And the components of those dyes have different molecular weights and differing solubilities in the isopropyl alcohol that I'm using here. Let me scooch it over so it can be a little more centered there. All right, so we know that as the alcohol goes up, as it meets those components that are more soluble in the alcohol, it carries them further up the paper. So we should see a nice, kind of rainbow separation of the different dyes that make up each of these three different kinds of ink. All right, well, let's go, uh, let's go look at the pre-lab and uh, cause it's got a nice demonstration there about uh, paper chromatography. And it's actually a little bit uh, more along the, the lines of what we were gonna have you do had we been in lab today. And then we'll come back here in about 30 minutes and, and take a peek at these things. All right, so like I mentioned at the blackboard, our intention had been for you to separate these same amino acids, this glycine, tyrosine, lysine, and aspartic acid, and, and an unknown mixture of any, any two or three or all four of those, and have you separate them out and determine what was in your mixture. And in each case, we were going to have you calculate that retention factor that I mentioned before. And that's the distance that the component has moved from its starting line divided by the distance the solvent has moved. And so, again, the reason they use that is because it's consistent from analyst to analyst. If the solvent moves farther, the dot moves farther. All right, and that way, if, if one person lets theirs develop a little longer than any other person, at least their retention factors are always going to be the same, at least for the same kind of component in that same kind of solvent. All right, well, let me pull up the pre-lab. Okay, on this pre-lab sheet, we pretty much tried to mimic what we were gonna try to do to you in the lab experiment with the four amino acids, glycine, tyrosine, leucine, and aspartic acid. The pre-lab doesn't do it justice because when you do the actual separation, we have to spray a staining agent on the amino acids. Each one turns its own unique shade of purple and the spots kind of spread out in different shapes. So they have their own unique shape and color. But again, if you take a ruler and you measure the distance the dot moved from its starting position divided by the distance the solvent moved where the wet spot would have stopped, that retention factor is unique to the glycine. And so it's easy enough to calculate the retention factors then for each dot of your knowns. And based on those retention factors, identify what was in the unknown. Note here that they want you to compute a retention factor for each spot on the chromatograph, that means each and every spot. Two for each unknown, I want every spot with a retention. So just make sure you show me somewhere here on the sheet 
And then they want to identify, well, what amino acids do you believe were in unknown number one and unknown number two? And again, not too hard to figure when you look at their retention factors. It was interesting when we do the lab, the colors match up nicely too with the unknowns and, and the knowns. All right, well then they ask you this last question, if the solvent had traveled twice as far would the retention factor have changed? And explain your answer. Well, again, I kind of alluded to this earlier in our in our discussion just a moment ago. So I'll leave it up to you to, to condense that into a, a reasonable answer. All right, well, let's go back and look at our, our demonstration with the felt tip pins and see how that all turned out. Okay, well, just a quick wrap up on our demonstration. Not nearly as exciting as it would have been in lab. And we separated the amino acids. That's a lot more fun. But we did get a nice separation, I noticed, on the ink from the different felt tip pens. Here's the red one. See this real close. I think you can see that there are two different bands of color there, kind of a, a magenta band right here up near the top, and then kind of a peach color almost at the very top edge that makes up the red. Looks like there might be another band of dye right in between. But it separates into its component dyes. Let me pull up another one here. Here's the blue one. And apparently just is made up of maybe a couple different bands there of different blue formulations to make that, that particular ink. I think the black's about the most interesting. It's got several different bands of color that you can see there that they mix together in order to make the black. And I'm sure that that chromatograph is kind of unique to this lot of ink. When they change their formulations, the chromatograph would look significantly different. All right, so anyway, that was just a quick demonstration then of how solubility can be used to separate a mixture. And in this case, the mixture was just a lot of different dyes in order to make uh, the inks for those felt tips. Okay, well, you got to admit that that was practically painless. Well, all I need from you now is that pre-lab sheet. And don't forget the quiz that I sent you over the hybridization, hybridization lab from last week. And that pretty much does it for this semester. Uh, I'll get all the scores uh, tabulated and send them out to you so you can look them over before I make them official. Uh, if there's any questions or anything that I can do to help you out here at the end of the semester, please don't hesitate. You know, just give me a shout. And I just want to wish you good luck in all your endeavors. And, uh, you know, drop me a line when you get a chance. All right, well, so long from Labs in the Barn. See you around.